unknowns and questions. The problem, so what I did is I went through and I thought to myself, okay, he, we've learned some things, but we really don't have not learned everything. And I was trying desperately to understand why this happens. So that took me on a search of why does chronic pain happen? Why do we have problems on the axon? Like what causes those gated channels to attach and allow us to have sensations that we wouldn't otherwise have in a way that we shouldn't be having them? How and what and why, why does that happen from a back injury? So how do the two connect? And so here is the problem in answering that question is that if you have chronic pain, it is never the same in two people. So if, if Megan has chronic pain and Joe has chronic pain and they both have chronic pain because of a low back injury, they're still gonna have a difference in what their pain, pain presents as and how it presents. So we can't take a sa controlled sample of people and test for this. That prevent that presents a huge problem in honing in on a cure, right? If you know, usually when we can help, when we want to hone in on a cure, we want to say when A happens and B happens, we get C. Not when A happens and B happens, Joe gets C and Megan gets F, because then we have no idea what's happening and why that happens. And that is kind of where we are, as far as I can find in the research. We know that chronic pain exists. We know that it happens, um, we know that it's different in everybody. We know that it happens when things go wrong, it's an unnormal response. We know that typically it's a overreaction to or the lack it's a reaction to a pain that actually, from an injury of sorts, that has actually healed, but the body still thinks it's painful. So we know that there's plasticity in the brain, like all those things we talk about, we know, but, but it's never the same twice. So how do we really study it and understand it? So that's, that's one of the problem. So then the question comes up, is it all neurologic in nature, even when it doesn't start that way? Why? So that was on this question too, uh, because all we've talked about is, okay, things change on that neuron. We get too many, we don't have enough inhibition and we have too much um, information coming in and everything goes wrong. But why? Why? So can, is, is it that the initial injury actually causes injury or damage to the peripheral nerve? And that leads to the chronic pain. Is that when we get chronic pain? I don't, that's not always when we get chronic pain. I don't think there are cases where there's chronic pain when there's not been an injury to the nerve, or maybe we just don't know that we're injuring the nerve in the process. So we don't really know the answer to all these questions. I don't, I wasn't able to find the answer to these questions. And so we might have to ask somebody to come in and answer them for us and see what he has to say. Um, so I will do my best to have that happen for us. But I, I looked and looked and looked in research and didn't find the answers. But I did find some interesting information. So here's what we can agree on. We agree that chronic pain is a result of some sort of neuroplasticity. So whether that's changes of the nerve itself in the peripheral nervous system or in the, in the central nervous system, or if it's actually brain changes, cortex changes that are going on. So we know um, that in the peripheral nervous system, chronic pain is typically the result of oversensitization or decreased inhibition of those primary sensory neurons. Right? In the central nervous system, it's, it's coined as central sensitization where we have increased transmission in the spinal cord, brainstem, and the neurons in the cerebral cortex. So it's no different than sensitization of the peripheral nerve, it's just in the central system, right? And then the other mechanisms could be increased facilitation of the descending pathways. So we're talking about the pathways from the brain, brainstem to the spinal cord, right? Maybe there's too much transmission coming down 
um, saying, oh, react, react, react to the stimuli. Maybe that's one thing. Or long-term potentiation, which is also strengthening of those synapses in the cerebral cortex or spinal cord. So maybe those synapses are getting too strong. And so now we're having too much information coming back around like, that's a danger, that's pain, that's it. Uh, inflammate. Let's get some inflammation, let's get some pain in here because something's really wrong, but it's actually only too, too strong, synapses that are too strong in the cerebral cortex and, and or spinal cord. Okay, so this is what we know. Does this mean that it's all neurological in nature? It means that the process of having chronic pain is neurologic in nature. It doesn't mean that the stimulus or the source was neurological to start with, but it means that uh, the trigger, say, I'm gonna say something really stupid. Say it is a soccer ball in your nose. That was the trigger. That's obviously not neurological. That's kind of, well, I mean, that's a bad thing because the nose doesn't really have a joint. But anyway, <laughs> it's not really neurological when it starts. But then the messages are always sent via neurons to your brain, through your peripheral nervous system, through your central nervous system, and then into your brain, which is central nervous system. Um, so the problem is happening in those neurological pathways. So maybe that's the answer to the question. So I did more research though, because I wasn't satisfied yet. <laughs> so now I'm gonna take you on a trip and we're starting here. So reasons why, why chronic persistent pain? So one thing is back to the memory that you were just talking about, Lane. So here we had a study with neonatals that were in intensive care and or had surgeries. Um, they seem to be more sensitive to a second insult at the same site and they're finding increased excitation of microglia. I'll explain what microglia are. Those are the astrocytes and we were talking about last time. Possible because microglia have an immune memory and because the nociceptive pathways had actually changed in structure. So remember the nociceptor is the, the receptor that says danger, our danger receptor, pain receptor. So the actual structure of the nociceptor had changed and because there was increased excitation of microglia when there was a second insult at the same site. So this refers back to the video we saw of the uh, snake bite first and then the overreaction second to a tree branch scraping his leg after the snake bite. And then a hyper reaction there. So that is because he's got a uh, second insult, too much excitation happening because of the memory of a previous thing going on. And we'll dig into what my we'll dig into the glia in a minute here. So the other thing was there was a pos they were saying it's a possible existence of a positive feedback loop that increases the with, um, increasing reactivity that plays a role in the transition from an acute to a chronic pain. So a positive feedback loop, meaning um, something starts it and it just keeps going around and keeps going around and keeps going around because one thing synapses and it gets the other things synapse and then something else synapses and sort of, sort of just spreads away and gets out of control, yeah? So um, this might be a factor in the 10 to 50% of patients who develop persistent pain fo following common surgical operations. Yeah. So glial cells, we're back here, but we're gonna include in what we call the glial cells, the astrocytes, microglia, and satellite glial cells. So what are they? Again, the astrocytes are the ones that are found around the neurons. They're both in peripheral and in central nervous system. And they're there right, right beside the neuron, helping the transmission of the synapses, right? So they were helping get from myelin over the nose of reindeer, right? Myelin to myelin to myelin along the axon and to the next neuron so that we can have our action potential and our like, and then like enough excitement to send the message onward. So they're typically helping. They're also helping with nutrients. So stimulating the blood flow, controlling the blood flow around the neurons. So they're really responsible for neuron health in that way. 
They also can regulate the external chemical environment. So why is that important? Is because there's this chemical gradient going on. I'm gonna simplify a lot, so forgive me, Lane. <laughs> there's this chemical environment, right? And so the chemical environment is what lets us open and close our gates, which allow our um, sodium, potassium, all in and out of the cells, right? There has to be a balance all the time. If there's not a balance, we get excite excitation and we get information passing that we want or don't want perhaps. So if something goes wrong in an astrocyte, you can see we can over synapse, we can under synapse, we can have the wrong chemical balance, which means we can let in too much potassium, too much sodium, and then we're starting off this whole weird excitation pattern or weird loop going on, right? And these astrocytes are in touch with multiple neurons. So they can also release pro-inflammatory toxins, right? So that can prolong inflammation and continue our pain cycle, bummer. And um, we already said they can increase synaptic transmission and decrease inhibition, allowing that pain perception. And then they can, this system can lead to long lasting inflammatory and neuropathic pain. So that's back to the inflammation being a trigger, right? For chronic pain, lasting inflammation. In fact, we don't like seeing inflammation that lasts too long, which is why the inflammatory response is good initially. We want you cut yourself. We want some inflammation around there to bring in our nutrients so we can stitch your skin back up, but we don't want inflammation six months after your knee surgery. That's bad news, right? Okay, so microglia are found in the brain. They're necessary during development to modulate the synapses in the central nervous system. So they're activated after a nerve injury also. They even change their shape and they increase prolif proliferation as early as two days after a nerve injury. Right. Neuropathic pain and acute, it could be neuropathic pain, it could be acute inflammatory pain. Um, there are some inhibitors that can reduce pain from microglia. These are inhibitors that you can take like pills. There are medicines that are inhibitors that can reduce the pain from microglia, initially inhibiting them, but they don't seem to last. So we haven't figured out how to inhibit them over the long term. So they work like for an initial injury, but they don't work as our pain really becomes chronic. But that would be an interesting thing, right? So if we could come up with something that would stop the overexcitation or the under inhibition or um, stop the microglia or the glial cells, any of them from activating more than they need to, if we could control it at that level, that's when we could potentially control a chronic pain response. And it wouldn't matter if it's Joe's or Megan's, right? It wouldn't matter whose chronic pain it is because we would get it at the point where things are going wrong, if this is what's going wrong. So then we also have the satellite glial cells, which are only in the peripheral nervous system in both sensory, um, in the sensory, both in sympathetic and parasympathetic, right? So each cell is in contact, in this case, with only one neuron, it helps the synaptic transmission. And um, research is showing that they're activated with painful injuries and can help lead to prolonged inflammatory neural pain. Okay. And then I brought you to this, this is a lot. And I took this right out of this um, article from 2013 and it seems like a long time ago, but I just thought it was interesting to look at. Definitely, I was trying to make things easier. So if this confuses you, you can toss it. But I was just trying to go through this little chart here. So we have um, a glial reaction. So changes of the glial markers and morphology. So what could that mean? Um, it could mean the shape of the cell changes. It could be that um, it's marker, so meaning what it says, its name <laughs> for the world outside of it changes. So that it's not recognized in the same way could change, right? So we could have regulation of receptors and channels and transporters in glia. We usually have that, right? Um, and then we could have the signaling pathways change. We could have then cytokines and chemokines, which are toxins, start being released. Then we could try and release some glial mediators to slow things down. Then we have some interaction with neurons. But so we're just getting out of control here. We're getting everything is getting upset and then they're trying to resolve the problem, but that sort of makes this pain cycle because you can't solve the problem and then 
the one who was upset in the beginning is still upset and the problem solvers are overreacting. So now we end up in this cycle of persistent pain. So that is a theory here of what could happen to get that pain feedback loop going on. So there, the question in this article, the article is actually called, um, is chronic pain a gliopathy? Is it, is it a fault of glial cells that this is all happening? Do you guys have a picture in your head of that slide with the axon and the glial cells, astrocytes around it? All right, so here we are. With, so if you're looking here, we have our oligodendrocytes, we have our astrocytes, and you can just see they're here in the environment right around our neuron and its lovely myelinated axon, right? So they're here floating all around, astrocytes working with multiple cells, oligodendrocytes also working with multiple neurons here in this picture. Um, and so they're here in this environment. So if this environment goes chaotic, the poor neuron in it can't hold its own anymore. It gets a signal, it gets told what to do, and it overfires, underfires, sends the wrong message, right? And that's, and then these, what they're saying is these cells in around, circulating around this neuron may be the problem that's causing the neurons to freak out. Yeah, and so that's gonna keep happening until they calm down these cells around the neuron. Here's another interesting thing, notes, a microglia are highly active after a spinal cord injury. So we've been able to see that for certain. Um, they can also be activated after chronic opioid exposure, some kinds of diabetic neuropathy and surgical incisions. Hmm. Microglial reactions can be seen after deep tissue and joint injury. And it's also been noted that prior neonatal injury can lead to increased microglial reactions to subsequent injury. So there's the memory piece again, right? So it seems likely, it seems a likely theory because um, what happens, we didn't, I didn't talk to you guys about the opioids, opioid exposure um, and opioids. And, and that is because it's a whole nother discussion. Um, we could introduce opioids as medicines and we tend to get less sensitive to them over time, but our body also creates opioids. So it creates opioids inside when things are going wrong. So we could introduce it or it could be happening inside of our body um, and causing the microglia to activate. But also from the diabetic neuropathy, right, is when you lose sensation due to diabetes and then surgical incision, obviously. And there's been research around being more likely to have um, pain after surgery happens. People get chronic pain after surgery sometimes just from the incision. It's interesting that, you know, when we have pain, we're given opioids or we have them naturally to help with that pain, but then it can cause malfunctions to cause more pain. Is that right? That is right. Mm -hmm. Yes. My mom used to say, um, a little bit of everything. That's the key. <laughs> so yeah. it's never too much of any one thing. <laughs> and so this would be one of the situations where not too much. And we know, um, I don't know if you guys have followed, but there's been, you know, the opioid crisis we had, I think I want to say in the 2000s, where people were being prescribed opioids and we're becoming addicted because there was no control over the opioids. Um, and so they've since been treated a lot more for the over for the prescription. They've been treated a lot more carefully. And now they're not used enough sometimes because people are so afraid. So, um, but yes, because you get less and less sensitive over time and you need more and more to get the same relief, your body ends up becoming sensitized to it. So it ends up not helping with chronic pain after all. In the beginning, it helps with an acute pain, but op opioids for chronic pain aren't a good idea, it turns out. So, all right, what do we do about this for our clients who suffer? So in order to decrease chronic pain, no longer related to injured tissues. And the reason I wrote that is because we want to be sure that the chronic pain isn't related to an injury that is still there or a tissue that's not healed, right? We have to be sure that that's the case before we, before we are sure that it's chronic pain. 
right? Or we could see something as simple as that video we saw where the reaction was so severe to a scratch of, from a branch that we know that that is the wrong, wrong reaction to a stimulus. But otherwise, we, act, that we need to be sure that there is no injury, current injury, before we can say, okay, this is chronic pain. Because people can have uh, ankle Achilles tears that are go undetected for a while and they just keep slowly tearing more and more and the person's pain doesn't go away for six months. Instead, we need to be sure that that's not the case because if that's the case, we're not gonna get rid of the pain unless we heal that Achilles tendon or do something about that Achilles tendon, right? So we just need to be sure about that. Then we need to set the brain and the nervous system right again. But how do we do that? So um, it can be super challenging to help clients without making them think that we're telling them the pain's in their head. And this is so big. Um, and I think so many doctors mess up on this point over and over again, they mess up on this point. And clients, I can't tell you how many clients I've had come to me in tears saying, the doctor told me it was all in my head. I've gotten phone calls. Could it be that this is all in my head? But my back really, really hurts. Is it all in my head? And, and I always have to say, no, it is not all in your head. It is all very real pain, right? And so we need to explain to them, we understand it's very real pain, but that maybe the real pain that they're feeling is not a result of the injury they initially had anymore. That it's a result of the brain processing or the nervous system processing that pain signal still, even though the tissue has healed. So, um, and what we found, what they found in the research is already telling people that it is a process that their body has done with the initial injury, the pain process. And usually when the tissues heal, the pain process shuts down, but in your case, it did not. So your pain is very real, but it's not because you have an injury anymore. It's because this process is still going on and we need to find a way to stop it. So if you can explain that to clients, that already makes them start getting better. And that's incredible. That's incredibly powerful. So like we've talked about so many times before, we have the gift of being able to spend an hour with our clients. If you can spend an hour, that's so much more time than the doctor's five minutes, right? So we have a chance to really tell them, I believe in you, to really listen to them and help them understand what's happening in their body and we'll go through some examples of exactly how you're going to do that or how you can do that some ways to do that um, so the other thing to really understand is there's no amount of manual work on the body that's going to lessen the pain at this phase right i could go in as i could be the best physical therapist on the planet and if I spend an hour with my hands on the client trying to fix a problem that is already fixed, that's not really damaged, I'm not going to get anywhere. They might feel some relief from having that close contact. They might feel some relief from a little bit of loosened muscles, but it's not going away. There's no way I'm helping this if I don't address the whole situation. Yeah, and understand that it is chronic pain. Okay, so first things, ideas. Educate the client as to what's happening. Um, we need to explain. I already said that. Help clients move. Hey, this is what we do. This is what we're so good at. So when people can exercise, they get hormone release. You guys know this. And it doesn't have to be a big old cardio exercise to get the endorphins pumping high. It just needs to be some movement. Already we're getting some hormones released that help reduce pain. We can also, it, the movement itself also retains the motor cortex. So back to the smudging, we were talking about one finger versus two finger and the pattern, patterning, right? If we go back to moving one finger at a time, right, as fast as we patterned it into one finger when it was two, we can unpattern it back to one finger and a second finger, but we've got to move them separately. We've got to get moving for the brain to then repattern that again, right? So Lane, I'm picking on you today. I'm picking on you some more. It's like you said, you couldn't figure out how to walk after your hip fracture. You could not coordinate the movement to walk. Yes, and I should tell you, I should have videoed myself after my knee surgery the first day in the pool when I picked up the kickboard 
and I could not figure out how to kick my leg. Right after three weeks, I was three weeks pretty much of no nothing. I couldn't kick my leg. I was I was actually kicking and going sideways in my lane, pulling on the lane line, getting myself away from the lane. I could not make it kick. I didn't do any. It's my, it should be my glute and my hamstring kicking, right? Not so much my knee. Could not make my leg kick. I was laughing. I'm like, oh my gosh, it doesn't work. I needed to find the pattern again of how to make that leg work and how to make that leg kick. It was so discoordinated. It was un unreal after three weeks, you know? So if we start moving it, but now eight weeks later, I'm back to kicking. Today I kicked like I used to kick. Like today it happened. I was like, huh, I have some power back there and I'm actually kicking and I'm going straight. I'm not bumping the lane line looking like an idiot, right? <laughs> yeah, maybe. But um, so it took what, five weeks to get that back. So... We, but we can do it and we can do it with motion. Um, does it? The other interesting thing is if it is um, chronic pain and there's no tissue injury and the person has pain while they're doing the movement, do we need to worry a lot about the pain they're having during the movement? No, we don't. We don't need to worry that we're hurting some tissues. We need to worry only if they can tolerate it or not. So at this point, is it okay to say, I think we can, if you are comfortable with it, I think it's safe to move through a little bit of pain as long as your pain doesn't last after we're finished. Because we want to get your body moving. You can explain what you're doing and explain what's happening and say, I think it's okay. Can we try a little bit? And you tell me how you feel after today's session and we'll know where to go from there. So yes, Lane, go ahead. So do you think that that um, gradual moving through some kind of pain, restoring the motion kind of globally is resetting this, this, the sensory and the whole path, the whole thing is being reset and the nerves are like, Oh my God, I'm freaking out. No, I'm not. And it, it's like, suddenly everything starts to coordinate, but it can take, like an orchestra tuning and they're not all tuned and then suddenly they're tuned and we play. Yes. It, it yeah. Generally it's because it I'd need to be able to kind of explain this to someone in layman's terms. Yeah. If we'll I get to that too, even better, but yes, I think, I think you can safely say to them now it's different if, if they have pain after, right. I don't want to right. give somebody. And so a situation like fibromyalgia, I have them journal. I think I've told you this before. People have chronic pain and fibromyalgia, chronic, pain, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. I always have them journal. I keep really good notes on my session and I have them journal what else they did in that day, how their day went and how they felt when they woke up the next morning. Um, even for 24 hours after what that 24 hour cycle looks like after so that we can look at it and know what our what we did affect how it affected their whole day for two days later and know that if it was what we did or did they also meet in the garden and have to go carry their kid because they broke they fell down and scraped their knee and you know so we can figure out if what we did was actually the cause of the discomfort or um, or not or maybe they don't have more discomfort maybe they just feel uncomfortable while they're doing and then they're okay after. But yes, the idea is that we need to get some movement in there so we can change the pattern. Mm -hmm. We can change at least the cerebral cortex. We know that that's going to change if we can get them moving in a good alignment. So, um, and if we know there's no tissue damage right now, then we're not causing damage by having them move. Yeah. So decreased stress, here's where um, the stress can add to the pain. More stress equals more pain. It doesn't, it's, um, it just is. Your brain can't handle it. You're already in this up excited state if you're stressed. And so your level of tolerance is not as high. You can pass, surpass your level much more quickly when there's high stress. So that is how the stress can activate pain. Um, sleep, adequate sleep, decreases stress in general, allows the brain and body to heal. So getting adequate sleep is key. And the problem with some people is when they're in this much pain, they can't sleep. 
So if there's any way to get them to get some good sleep, uh, I would tell them, you know, this should be a priority. Maybe getting some good sleep would really help. And if you need help getting some good sleep, that's when you need to see somebody who can help you get that um, for whatever that takes, you know, but that's out of our league really. But just the information of giving them, giving the information that you really need to get good sleep so that you can heal also. And then there's a the meditation mindfulness which is big. So being able to check out, being able to have a little meditative practice or a mindfulness practice is really helpful. Breathing has been really helpful, which yay for us. Another thing we can do with them is have them breathe all the air in and all the air out fully. That is in Joe's book, right? So we can have them breathe. I have a client who came to me and she was in so much pain. She was just contracted through her whole body. You know, any movement was painful. Like just, you know, I could see it in her face and her whole body. And what I was thinking, this was kind of my intuitive thinking along with some of the input from this is that she, she has to reconnect movement with not being in pain. And so like my approach has been to, to move gently, but not in pain. So she's never in, in that sort of stress state as she's moving, but I, I don't, that was kind of my intuition, but I'm not, I'm wondering if, yeah. if that's I a think, good approach for her. I mean, I think that's a great approach if you can. And, but I think even educating her about why she has pain would help her be able to do more. There's fear. I so, have told her about that, what we were talking yeah, about too. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, one of the things I think Gina's probably heard me say this to a client recently is um, if you breathing. So I we had a client that had a really severe neck thing going on. And I said, I said to her, I said flat out, this is going to sound really weird to you. But if you're afraid of your pain, your pain's going to get worse. You have to just tell tell yourself, hey, this is neck pain. It's going to get better. Um, things are going to go into place and I'm going to feel so much better. And if you can tell your neck that, your pain will actually be less. It won't grab you as much. It won't bother you as much. And that's so true. So, I mean, I tell them, this is going to sound crazy, but I just want you to know, especially with the neck, I feel like I can't not tell them that because that really makes a huge difference. If you can just go, oh, yeah, yeah, that's my neck again. And oh, my neck's hurting again. Oh, well, it's going to fix itself. We're going to get better. I'm going to stretch it out. I'm going to do a few things and it's going to hurt for a bit, but it will get better. Like if you can have that casual approach to that pain, then the pain doesn't last as long. It's It can't hold on to you anymore. But if you go, oh no, it's my neck. <gasps> my neck, it's happening again. It's my neck, it's happening again. Then I'm now stuck like this and I can't take my hands away because my neck is gonna really fall off my he head, um, off my body if I take my hands away, right? And it's real, it's real. So maybe just having that conversation around, hey, which you sound like you already did, um, it's gonna be okay. We're gonna lay here and breathe and I want you to just relax. Tell your muscles to relax. They can do it. They can relax and it's gonna feel much better. And if they think you're crazy, they think you're crazy. But <laughs> I feel but like it's like reprogramming a growth mindset. And oftentimes when we see people and they are, you know, in a state of, you know, where they're aware of and, and kind of pattern into the pain, um, that it's catastrophizing that anything they might do that a lot of people feel like they did something and anything they do, one false move will kind of um, reignite this, this difficult situation. Um, but, you know, it's uh, what, to what you're saying, it's an attitudinal shift and that can be really a challenge for people. It, it, it's not an easy thing. So I think and that's an important part of the home program. Mm -hmm. And trusting what you're saying, that, that what you're saying is true is also not easy if they've associated with that pain. I mean, it's real pain. It's really, really bad pain. So um, so this is um, a clip I'm going to show you. I think we have time for it. 
um, from Adrian Lowe. He's the guy from South Africa who does a lot of teaching to PTs and about pain in general. So he's, it's kind of cheesy, but he's put together this little, two little um, scenarios where he's talking to a client, explaining the whole pain reaction to the client to give her the education. So I just thought it was interesting how he goes about it. So I thought we'd start with that. And then if we need more, we can go back and listen to him speak too, because he's a really good speaker. So I, I didn't start it right at the beginning. He just introduced himself to her and was telling her, you've been through so many physical therapists and I'm sorry, we haven't helped you yet, but I really want to help you. And you're probably wondering what you're doing here, but I'm here to explain to you why your pain won't go away because that is actually going to help you. So that's basically where we are in this talk. And here we go. Um, at any point, ask questions. This is your session. Remember, this is your back. It's your pain. You are the patient. It's your pain and you own your pain. So I'm going to just try and teach you some stuff as if we go this way. I want to ask you a quick question real quick. If you stepped in a rusted nail right now, yeah. would you want to know about it? Yeah. Why? So I could take care of it. Good. Uh-oh. You know, in all the years I've done this, I've never had somebody go, no, right? It makes sense. If we step in a nail, we want to know about it. So the question would be, how do we know about it? How do you know there's a nail? Well, this is the neat part about it. Our body has a nervous system. There are nerves all over your body. You've heard about nerves. Oh, yeah. Well, nerves, there are over 400 nerves in your body, 45 miles, by the way, if you put them all together. If you wiggle your big toe, the nerves at the back of your neck move. If you move your head up and down, the nerves in your lower back move. They're all connected like a big road system. It makes sense, right? Yeah. Well, every nerve in your body works like an alarm system. Every nerve has electricity in it. They're always buzzing along, enjoying life. If you step in a nail, the alarm system wakes up. It sends a message from your foot to your spinal cord, your brain, and says, what? There's a nail in the foot. By the way, we produce pain at that point. The brain will actually produce pain and say, stop. Look at your foot. Get the nail. Pull it out. And then we get a tetanus shot. We get to clean out the wound. We start wearing shoes around nails, right? So let me show you something real quick. If, as an example, let's say this is your right leg nerve, right? There are nerves all over your body. How many miles? 35. Excellent work. Now, there's a threshold. Every nerve is just buzzing along, enjoying life, right? And life is good. Nerves are just buzzing along, telling us about life. If I were to kick you in the leg right there, nerves will wake up, wake up, wake up, and then it activates the alarm, right? Mm -hmm. If I kick you in the leg, Adrian equals jerk. Is me. Call the lawyer, all right? Fair enough. It tells you to do something. Pull your leg away. If there's somebody unfriendly in my area. And the alarm will calm down, waiting for me to kick you again. That's how they work. So nerves wake up and they calm down. That makes sense to us? Yes. Okay. Well, that is how nerves typically work. So watch this. When we step in a nail, the alarm system is buzzing along, enjoying life. And the alarm system wakes up, wakes up, wakes up, and then sends a message. The message in this case is there's a nail in the foot, get some help, right? Mm -hmm. And the alarm will slowly calm down. By the way, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever stepped in a nail or a thumbtack or something like that? Oh, yeah. A technical thumbtack, not a nail. And did it hurt? Oh, Yeah. When you pull the thumbtack out, did the pain just go away? No, it kind of throbbed a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it throbbed. So, and that's pretty neat because the alarm doesn't go from everything to nothing. When you pull the nail out with a thumbtack, it doesn't go boom, gone. It's still sore for an hour, a few days even, right? So if you watch this, the alarm system slowly goes down. Why? Because it remembers you step in the thumbtack. And just to make sure you don't do it again, it'll come down. How are we doing today? We're good, good, good. And goes down, right? Fair enough. By the way, how long ago did that happen? Oh, when I was a kid. When you're a kid. So right now you don't feel it, obviously. Yeah. So it goes away over time. And we kind of forget about it. Fair enough. That is how nerves work. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. I know you're sitting here wondering, well, what does this have to do with me? I'm going to show you something really interesting. Because this is what the new research has shown us. In most people, what happens there is our alarm system again. Alarm buzzes down here. Life is good. Something activates the alarm. It could be from an injury, a lot of emotions in our life. The alarm system activates and then the alarm sends a message. But instead of coming all the way back down, your alarm system literally starts living at this level here. It becomes what we call extra sensitive. And that is what I think is a big part of your pain right now. When I were, was bending you forward, you were bending, you barely wanted to bend forward. You didn't really want to go backwards. You can barely move your leg up. I can barely touch your back. And over time, people get worried about this. What's going on? You know, in the old days, somebody could push on my back to massage, therapist could do some nice deep massage. Now she can barely touch my back. And a big part of it is the alarm system. Your alarm system has become very sensitive, mm -hmm. all right? And so what we find in a lot of people, unfortunately, it's about one in four people, the alarm stays up there. 
And this is the important part. This is really what I would like you to get today. If you may watch this. In the old days, your alarm system gave you lots of space to do stuff. Life. You could run, you could bike, you could stand three hours and cook a fantastic meal. You could sit at a desk for hours answering emails, doing your job. Well, now the alarm system is so sensitive, it takes five minutes of walking and the pain comes on. You can stand for three minutes cooking a meal and the pain comes on. Does it mean there's nothing wrong with your tissues? Tissues heal. I know you've got a bad back and I know you've been hearing things like arthritis and you've heard things like I've got a bulging disc and all these horrible terms. Well, tissues heal. They heal really, really well. And all I want you to know is as the tissues get better and they get better and better and better, the alarm system stays elevated. Nobody went and turned the alarm down. So when you bend forward and you say, oh, I feel my back, does it mean there's something wrong? It just means you're sensitive. And that's a big part. I don't want you to leave today going, well, Adrian says it's all in my head. This is normal. It happens in all of us. And it, and it happens in this alarm system. And this is a very big part of it. What we have found is when patients leave and understand, you know what? Sure, I hurt my back. Did I hurt my back? Sure. Did I damage some of the tissue? Absolutely. I know you did. The story told me. But you should recover over time. What has happened now is your alarm system has remained incredibly sensitive. And that's one of the reasons why you're struggling to move and exercise and do all this stuff. So now the therapist or the doctor has you do exercise and two minutes in, it hurts. So now you start thinking exercise is not good for me because it makes me sore. Think of it this way. In your house is an alarm system. For me to activate your alarm at your house, I have to bash out the window, right? I bash the window out, the alarm goes off. Eh and calls the police, fair enough? Mm -hmm. Your alarm system in your body has become so sensitive now when a leaf blows by your house, the alarm goes off. Can you see what we're saying here? Mm -hmm. It's almost like your car alarm. You barely touch your car and the alarm goes off. It's too sensitive. We gotta turn the alarm system down. So now your question for me should be, how do I turn it down? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing today. Does it make sense? It does, I so, don't know how to do it though. Exactly, and that's exactly what we're gonna do here. I know you've gone to therapists and they're going to show you exercise. You, you know all about exercise. You've seen seven therapists. They probably showed you the really cool stuff, but you don't understand what's going on. And that's what we're doing today. So I know it seems like we're just talking about stuff, but this is really, really important. The other therapy will work fantastic. All right. Now, this is what people always ask us. All right, Adrian, wait a minute. You said the alarm system is extra sensitive. So here we go again. There's your alarm. Instead of the alarm system running down here, your alarm system is running up here, right? So now people ask us, why did my alarm not come down? Can you think why that would be? Um, fear you're going to do it again. Afraid. You're afraid it's going to hurt again. You're afraid the back's going to go give us some more problems. That's what happened to you. You've had failed treatments. Think about it this way. Your back has been hurting how long now? Three years. Three years. And it's no fun. I mean, every day. Think about it. From the moment you wake up in the morning, your back hurts. Mm -hmm. That's no fun, right? So in these three years, you've been looking for treatment. You've gone from therapist to therapist to doctor to chiropractor, massage therapist, etc. If treatments aren't working or they work just for a day or two, will the alarm come down? No, no it won't. Fine. It'll stay there. It'll just say, I'm not getting help. If the one therapist says it's a muscle, another therapist says it's a joint, another therapist says, well, it's this. It's this, it's this, it's this. Will the alarm go up or down or? It'll stay. It'll stay up there, yes. So th what you're going through is normal. It happens in all of us. There are worries about family. You've told me your family, which was very supportive in the beginning, are now saying, eh, you know, come on, you need to work, sort of helping around the house. We're tired of your pain. You told me there may be problems at work because you're taking time off all your doctor's visits. All of these things in our life, stresses and worries, keeps the alarm system there. I just want you to know this is normal. It happens in all of us. All right? If, if we go through stressful times, the alarm system will activate. And so none of this is a bad thing. It's just you're asking me the question again, how do we turn it down? And that's what we want to cover. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I want to share something else with you as we work your way through it. But I want to see how smart you are. See if you were listening to me, right? Okay. How many miles of nerves? 45. How many nerves? 40. 400. 400. Yeah, I know they're close, aren't they? Now, I told you that every nerve in your body works like what? What is the metaphor we're using here? Nerves work like an... Uh, it's an alarm system. system. Yes. Nerves work like an alarm system. They tell us about things like if I hit you in the arm, if you step in a nail, that makes sense? Yeah, okay. it hurts. Nerves work like an alarm system. Now, here's the neat part. Your alarm system you have is top of the line ADT, best on the planet. Your alarm system not only tells you when you step in a nail, it tells you about life. You have sensors. There are sensors all over your body. There are sensors that will go off when it's cold out. 
when the cold front comes through Seattle, these guys go ding, 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 and they tell you it's cold. So this, you need a coat. Exactly. Watch this. These are little sensors that they've done. Some cool research they've done a few years ago shows us in all of these little nerves you have in your body. There are sensors. There are little sensors that will tell you when it's cold out. So when you walk outside, the cold air comes by, they set the sensors off. If enough of these sensors sets off, the alarm goes off and tells you it's cold outside. Cold outside. There are sensors that will tell us when we're stressed. When we get stressed, we produce stress chemicals. So we get we get stressed, we get nervous, we get anxious, we're facing a surgery, we are mad about the traffic in Seattle this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? We produce stress chemicals. When they flow through our body, they wake up all these sensors and we can feel our back. So if you come to my clinic and say, I, I feel my back when I'm stressed, what is it really telling you? It's just telling that your alarm's on. You're stressed. It's not telling you something's wrong. It just tells you you're stressed and you should work out your stress, right? It's activating the alarm. Yes, absolutely. It's activating the alarm. But the thing that's activating it isn't an injury, it's stress. The situation. Exactly. Absolutely. And now we can work on strategies to change that. How about movement? There are sensors out there that will tell us when we're moving. Like when I had you bend forward, you went only a little bit and you said, stop. And I asked you what was going on. You said it was hurting you. I don't want to go any further. Well, very likely a bunch of these guys went off and told you what? We're moving. You don't like movement because movement means you hurt. You told me that. So oh, I just want you to know that these sensors go on all the time. The last one I want to quickly cover. When you have the flu, where do you hurt? All over. All over, right? Because when you have the flu, we produce immune molecules, little molecules that travel through our body to make sure we're healthy. They fight all infections, anything going on. Well, guess what? There are sensors in our body. When these guys float by, they go off. So we do, the sensors are going off all over our body. So what do we do? It feels so all over. And this also happens with people in pain. Here's a message. When you get odd aches and pains, when I'm stressed, I feel my back. When it's cold, I feel my back. When I have the flu, you know, I feel my back more. Guess what? It's just telling you it's cold. I'm stressed. I'm moving. I'm having the flu. Can you see what it is? Totally. In the old days, a lot of people would tell us stuff when they move or bend or when they get stressed, they feel the back. It must be that bad back I've got. The back is good. Your back is healed to the best of its ability. All right. And that's how. It, so we have tissues that injured, but they recover. In the meantime, the nervous system, your alarm system ramps up. It's just there to protect you. And this is normal. It happens in all of us. Chapter four summary. Using metaphors allow patients to be, develop a deeper understanding of their pain. Pain neuroscience education is a conversation, by the way, between clinician and patient using discussion, examples, questions, and answers. And you need to make the unknowns known for the patient.